Um, but we could also say that we're recording because you can talk about a chef schedule like it's never going to happen like this. Just like yeah, the stars well, align, you know. You can t- yeah say it like we gave Melissa dates. He's like tomorrow, <laughs> two o'clock I was like, tomorrow. I was like, well, I don't want anything. <laughs> <laughs> this will work. Hey everyone, this is episode 208 of Bourbon Pursuit, and we've got a lot of news to go through, and the first one is that there is a huge news break. The U.S. Supreme Court, in a 7-2 decision, has struck down a two-year residency requirement for anyone seeking an initial license to operate a liquor store in Tennessee. Now, why is that important? Well, because you might have remembered back on Bourbon Community Roundtable number 29, we discussed this very topic. It's total wine versus the state of Tennessee, and it has a lot of implications that are really wrapped up inside here because the Commerce Clause, which is a part of the United States Constitution, is wrapped up in here. This means it could potentially open up interstate commerce and shipping across all state lines for bourbon. We're going to be paying really close attention to this one because it's a huge win for consumers and we'll see really what effects are going to happen in the months to come. The Kentucky Bourbon Trail Craft Tour is now expanding with more distilleries, a new look, and an upgraded finishing prize. The expanded craft tour will break down into four different regions, northern, central, western, and the bluegrass. This will help guests map out their distillery excursions to all corners of the Commonwealth. Adam Johnson, Senior Director of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail Experiences, who was on the podcast way back on Episode 8, talked about the Bourbon Trail then. And he's saying that each region will have streamlined itineraries and suggested stops, with visitors earning a collectible challenge coin after completing each territory. Fans who tour all 20 of the stops will earn a free, customized barrel stave to display their coins. This showpiece also comes with an official Kentucky Bourbon Trail tasting glass, and you can get the Craft Tour Passport. It has been redesigned as a new souvenir guidebook with nearly 70 pages of distillery information, cocktail recipes, suggested travel routes, maps, events, and more. Those can be purchased at participating distilleries for $3, with the proceeds going to further the KDA's efforts to craft a better drinking culture with select social responsibility and environmental sustainable partners. You can read all about the trail and which distilleries are a part of it at kybourbontrail.com. We're starting to roll out more barrels into our private barrel program from major distilleries. We recently sold out of our Elijah Craig, Buffalo Trace, and two Four Roses barrels in a matter of just a few hours. And we currently have our Knob Creek Rye and Maker's Mark 46 private selections up for sale in our Patreon community with not one, not two, but three Russell's Reserve barrels to shortly follow here in the next two months. But the big news is to announce that we are headed back to Heaven Hill. We're going there in August to select not one, but two Elijah Craig barrels. We're going to have eight barrels rolled out for us to select from. And, well, I kind of lied. That really wasn't the big news. The big news is that we've also been allocated one bourbon and one rye barrel from that small little distillery that's next door to Heaven Hill. Yeah, you might have guessed it. It's Willet. This will be happening in August as well. We're excited, super excited to be able to bring not only just these barrels to these private barrel programs where we get to taste and try these unique expressions, but it's more about bringing these experiences to our Patreon community. So if you're a supporter of us, make sure that you can go and you get yourself signed up. And if you want to know more about it, you can go to patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. And if you support the podcast at over $10 more per month, you can get yourself entered to be a part of this distillery excursion as well. Just look for the post and get yourself entered. And thanks again to our podcast partner, Kegan Bottle, out of the Southern California area for making all of this possible. You can get all kinds of bourbon shipped to your door at keg, the letter N, bottle.com. Now, for today's show, if you're a fan of good bourbon, then you're likely a fan of good food too. Today's guest is an intersection of those two, combining a culinary background with his love for the South and, of course, bourbon. You may know Chef Newman Miller from his appearance on Top Chef Season 16. He's also the executive chef and owner of Star Hill Provisions at Maker's Mark and the Harrison Smith House in Bardstown. We talk about his culinary background, where he was a part of the team who created the McDonald's McGriddle. 
And he also talks about being behind the scenes at Top Chef and some of the celebrities he got to know through the process. We then start talking about his introduction to bourbon and how he befriended Drew Colesveen of Willet to start really trying some amazing whiskey and how at the end of the day that really led him to running his own restaurant with inside of the Maker's Mark Distillery. So if you're a wannabe chef or if you're an occasional TV dinner kind of person, this episode is going to have something for you. Oddly enough, many people still don't know what a podcast is. So if you've got a friend or a relative that's just now getting into bourbon, show them how to subscribe to a podcast and they will know every time a new episode is dropped. Thanks for being our boots on the ground and spreading the good word of bourbon. Up next, we've got Joe Beatrice from Barrel Bourbon, and then we've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, this is Joe Beatrice from Barrel Bourbon. We blend and bottle at cast strength, just as nature intended. Lift your spirits with Barrel Bourbon. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Happy birthday, America. It's Independence Day, and this week we celebrate our country's rich heritage and great history. Bourbon is at the forefront of this country's history. From the moment that we are a new country, George Washington and Alexander Hamilton decide to tax whiskey distillers, and whiskey distillers didn't appreciate that very much, so they tarred and feathered the whiskey tax man. This time would be known as the Whiskey Rebellion, and it was the first time that the federal government had actually deployed federal troops against its own people. Whiskey would find itself in the political circles for years to come. From the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897 to the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, and from President Taft giving bourbon its first definition and definitions for whiskeys to the Congressional Declaration of 1964 that made bourbon a unique product in the United States to President Obama and McConnell uh, having discussions that would bring bourbon into the fold to President Trump giving all kinds of tariffs all over the world that would lead to uh, retaliatory tariffs from other countries such as Canada, Europe, China, etc., etc., etc. So, this holiday, don't drink a beer. For God's sakes, don't let anyone drink vodka. It's really, celebrate America. Go to your store, buy a nice bottle of bourbon, pour yourself a couple fingers, and sip. After all, it's the American way. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram, at Fred Minnick. That's at Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan, the original duo here, doing uh, a kind of another spin on bourbon. You know, we... You know, we, we've talked about this before, and we were actually talking uh, to this chef early before we actually started recording, and there is a good, heavy instance of if you're drinking good, you're also eating good. And we looked at this and said, you know, there's an idea we can start bringing some culinary aspects into it. And our guest today is not only is very well versed in the culinary side, but also he's got a rich history with bourbon being even from, you know, the Bardstown area and even in Louisville. So it's going to be fun, interesting just to be able to talk about that too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you, food, I'm, that's one thing I'm passionate and love, as Kenny may know, uh, and my gut he, sometimes shows. He's, but, a, uh, he's, a, he's, a, wa- he's a walking yelp. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is, yeah. But uh, our guest today, so as everyone knows, I'm from Barstown, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> uh, one thing missing from the bourbon scene, the bourbon trail, was like hospitality, good food, good experiences down in Barstown to kind of go along with. And our guest today kind of saw that uh, and filled that need. So I'm really excited to see like how he got involved in that area because it's something that was needed and he's done a great job at it so let's dive into it yeah and, and you know it's also good because we've had a chance to actually talk to our guest today multiple occasions throughout the past the few years yeah. and it just a few whiskey pigs we've, yeah, uh, yeah a few different events crashed. and stuff like that uh, <laughs> a few few different dinners at, at his his places as well and you know now the stars just aligned and we were able to to sort of make this happen and 
we'll get into why we're actually able to record because the apparently the uh, the schedule of a chef is pretty hectic. So we'll get into that too. So to date on the show, we have thankfully he had his haircut today, oh, so we yes. could squeeze him in. You know, <laughs> and his haircut happened to be right by us, so <laughs> it all worked out. <laughs> yeah. So today on the show, we have Chef Newman Miller. He was featured on episode two of the most recent season of Top Chef. He is the chef owner at Star Hill Provisions, that you can be found at Maker's Mark. He is also the executive chef and owner at the Harrison Smith House in Bardstown. He's been recognized by the James Beard Foundation, and now he's a celebrity podcaster making his way on yeah, Burn Pursuit. So, time. Now what? you've officially made it. Who, who cares about Padma? Hey, you know? Well, uh, you know what? The show is one thing, but Padma is another. Uh, well, you know that was, so I want you to be honest. <laughs> I, I had this towards the end, but might as well break it out since I'm, uh, we we're talking about it. How's Padma in life, real life? I got to be honest. I think that the, the way she acted towards everybody that I saw, the way she was towards me, it, it raised my level of uh, opinion of her tremendously. I yeah. mean, obviously, she's beautiful. I think in person, maybe more so. You know, my wife would agree. I, I made sure, you know, Rachel was on site too. But she was just so kind. Yeah. Um, everybody that was on the show was really kind. I mean, Tom Colicchio... They'd tell him he had another hour to wait. He'd get mad. I'd put him in the Kubota and we'd <laughs> ride up to the lake, you know, and uh, sort of talk about the future of Makers and what we had going on there. He told me some crazy stories about Gramercy Tavern, and it was like we'd known each other and we had met a day ago. So Padma cool. was great, but the, the whole group, they uh, they found a way to sort of surprise, I think. Uh, you watch TV that much, and you... You just don't think anybody has any time of day, but it was great. Oh yeah, very cool. And I probably jumped your schedule. No, so I, no, because honestly, <laughs> that's of questions. No, that's. But, I mean, that's top of mind, right? Everybody yeah. was going to wonder it. It's the yeah. most common question yeah. I get from the Top Chef experience. So, talk about when you got the news. Hey, Top Chefs come into Makers, and they're like, "Hey, you're going to be involved." How? What? What was going through your head? You know, it, it was amazing. Um, the way it actually happened was way back when they were doing the. Uh, the scouting trip for Top Chef. They were trying to pitch Kentucky as the state to come to. And it was down to us and one other state. I still don't know who it was. And I was going on vacation, and Seth Thompson uh, reached out to me, and I didn't respond. And then, uh, <laughs> no offense, it was just I was going on vacation the next day. It was the first one in four years with my family. We had to go. And then Rob Samuels called me, and I – and I answered, and he mentioned something about a group coming to Kentucky. And then uh, I think it was Kristen Branscombe. We ended up talking to the director of tourism, and they, you know, they just let me know they were coming to town and could I do it. So I drove my family to Florida. I flew back. I cooked for 12 people. I went to bed. I flew back. I was on the beach the next morning at 11 a.m. <laughs> wow. And so that was, uh, that was the start of it. And then it took about eight months before we found out whether that paid off or not. And uh, so, yeah, we we had a little bit of an investment in it in, at that time. But, I mean, I can't think of anything that we'd rather invest in. I mean, yeah. you know, this is why we came back to Kentucky was to try to show off where I'm from. My wife's from southern Indiana, um, so close enough. But, you know, I wanted to show off where I'm from and that there is hospitality, that there is culture. I mean, I think, you know, food and drink don't always get talked about in the culture section of things, but... It is, and um, so Top what, Chef just, yeah, it's a big spotlight. Yeah, so what were some of the reasons that I guess they chose Kentucky as to be featured on this season as opposed to other places? I think up and coming has to be part of it. I think that they really, there's, you know, uh, there's more people that have got the bug. They, they go, you know, sometimes they go away. They see what's in other places. They realize what they kind of are missing from back home. I think Kentucky's, you know, producing a lot of good artisans. I think that our farms, they had to look at our farmers and our agriculture and just say, wow, this is a, this is a really dynamic state when it comes to what grows here. What, you know, um, there's a lot. I mean, it, yeah. the cities are what, you know, everybody thinks about, Lexington and Louisville. But I think this season is really getting outside of the cities a lot. And that's the best part because just showing like from – end to end of the state, there's a lot of different regions and a lot of little niche products that even Kentuckians don't know about, but like I think are genuinely proud of. So what I want to know, like, cause you drive to Loretto and you know, <laughs> what, I wonder what these chefs, you know, had been to, to small towns or anywhere in Kentucky. What were they saying? Like, 
Like, where the hell are we? I mean, like, <laughs> what is going on here? What, what, what kind of the feedback? Because would they if you watch the show, you would know that they actually had to go to Loretto and then drive all the way back to Whole Foods in Louisville <laughs> oh, yeah. and then drive back to I was like, what? Loretto. There's no Whole Foods in Loretto? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Yeah. We, uh, <clears throat> we do have the, uh, the IGA, though. That oh, we, that's we right. We do a little shopping. You know what? <clears throat> it's a pretty... The response is the same from almost everybody that comes down there. The, the chefs, the tourists, the sort of... It's this white knuckle look, and they're sure that they just came down the wildest, you know, little back road they've ever been to. We ask them how they get here, and they actually came down the the proper way. The chefs, I think, were uh, brought in the back way. So you you all know there's more mm-hmm. than one way to get into Maker's Mark, yep. and uh, they were they were a little rattled. I you mean, go across that little shady one lane bridge. It's <laughs> it's one ish lanes. Yep. And, there's slop trucks coming the other way at you. I mean, that's what the tourist, I think that's really what gets you is if you get a slop truck coming at you or not. <laughs> like that's when I believe that you had a hard time getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's just another road. You know, I grew up in Washington County, so sure. I was just, that was how we used to drive. But uh, now the chefs were, they were very generous, I, I think, with it. I think that they're just excited. It, it's It's such a mental task to be on that show because so little of it is really about who's the best cook, right? It's who's the best cook in today's situation. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a mind bend to think about the way they sort of put these things together. They're not tricking anybody, but it's not just purely based on talent, everybody about, about how you can handle the situation. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and, the ride down is part of that, you know, <laughs> you get car sick, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. Uh, and, and you had a challenge too, cause you had to cook for all of them before. So talk about that and how so, challenging that was. That's what I was really wondering. <laughs> yeah. Like if you're, if you're like, cause you've got a lot of people there, you've got national spotlight. And if you're nervous during this whole time too, like, God, like this is a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's not the burn pursuit podcast. You know, you're on. It's <laughs> I, top you, chef. Bravo. <laughs> you know what though? I, I'll be perfectly honest. I think about it in the exact same way. Uh, every, everything I do, and it, it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's a hard way to go about it. It all means the same. And, and so cooking for those chefs meant a lot. But those dinners we do on Saturday nights, it means that much. And so to me, that part was okay. The volume yeah. <laughs> was unreal because we also did the catering for the team that was filming the show. Mm. So our team is about four. Uh, the kitchen oh, team wow. down at Makers at the time was four. And uh, we were catering for the 150 people that they brought on site. The restaurant was actually open for normal service. And then... We did that dinner that you saw, and it was 14 dishes for 14 people. And um, I think that just from volume, it was the most uh, taxing, one of the most taxing things we've ever done. But again, it, it was the coolest too. I mean, it was just so great that people really wanted to know more about things like frog legs. Yeah. You know, and why are there frog legs? And then you go, well, there might be a lot of frog legs here because we have more cattle than anybody uh, east of the Mississippi, state of Kentucky does. I and to have idea. cattle, yeah. yeah. So we're the, the largest beef producing state. And so to have cattle, you need those little ponds so they can drink and stay cool. And frogs do really well around lots of little ponds. So you end up growing up, going frog gigging. gigging yeah. and, and so it's just these sort of cultural things that may or may not make sense to people that aren't from here. But I love being a banana croquette. Oh, I yeah. got to show the banana croquette off. As long as I saw the <laughs> banana croquette, I was like, oh, my man. <laughs> That's what I, I have things. My grandma still makes them yes. Thanksgiving. You know, they're awesome. All right. So, yeah. so you got to school people that aren't like native from Bardstown and uh, backwoods that kind of grew up as a city folk. So yeah. kind of talk about what is banana croquette. I've never even had frog legs in my life. Okay. What? See, uh, I know. Yeah, you we'll need to go it. gigging at my pond, yeah. man. So, I'll take you down there. We'll get you down for we'll one of the Get you a flashlight yeah. and a, a gig. A f- that's all you need, a gig and a flashlight. But banana croquette, um, the way I grew up eating it was not the way I made for the TV show. I had to, I had to class it up a little bit. <laughs> you didn't do just banana mayo and <laughs> crushed nuts. Crushed peanuts. <laughs> That's it. it it's, a, it's a banana of varying ripeness. Depends on your family or whether somebody forgot to buy the bananas. You can always <laughs> tell. And uh, usually it's either a Duke's or a Hellman's. Uh, I've known people to do Miracle Whip. I, yeah, it's a big mistake. I, it's a big mistake. You got to do Hellman's. You got to go Hellman's. <laughs> and, and Duke's with the sugar can work a little bit, but then crushed peanuts. And my grandma had a, a hand crank P 
peanut crusher and she would use skin on Spanish peanuts. No mm-hmm. idea why. I don't I think, like the skin. I think we just use whatever planters we put. Yeah. <laughs> like, not too fancy. Well, the way we're doing it now, we actually have a farmer in Loretta, and they have heirloom peanuts. Oh. But they, they're five generations deep growing these peanuts in Loretta, and they have five little nuts in the shell. They're nothing like a normal. So I use those just so I could show them to the people and stuff. And the way we made it for the show, you're basically making almost like a hollandaise sauce. Eggs and vinegar and sugar. And you whisk it over a double boiler, it doubles in volume. You add a little bit of vinegar, apple cider vinegar to it. You keep whisking it, you take it off the heat. You add a little bit of peanut butter and you add a little bit of mayonnaise to that and it makes almost like a fudge sauce. Then you pour it all over the banana, Mm. then you put crushed nuts. So I had to chef it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's actually a recipe I found from the late 1800s. I collect cookbooks. And so I had some old Kentucky cookbook and they had this recipe in it. So it makes it so much better when you don't hear stories about it, but you can actually find it. So then when somebody questions you, you can, you know, take it back and say, look, this isn't just mayonnaise and the way we grew up with it. Sure. You know what I mean? Like there's a, it's rooted in something. This is the quick version. Yeah. That, you know. The way, well, and, and that's the only way I'd ever eaten it. Yeah. Honestly, until we got the call about the show and then I just went deep and I, mm-hmm. my most proud thing is getting the banana croquette. Somehow a little bit of attention because it's got to be the weirdest thing that uh, that I made for him for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Though. Yeah, you know Newman. The reason I respect you is because you do do banana croquettes and you do embrace like two of my favorite things ever are Jake's one hundred and fifty quick stop sausage, hot sausage, and you got to you got to get you got to give some some so background here. There's this. He grew up in Springfield, so Springfield and Bardstown, there's a road, 150, that connects them. The, this quick stop's, what, maybe halfway? It's right. almost, yeah, right right in the middle-ish. I mean, Botland yeah, is, about the, the halfway uh, point. is the town. But yeah. they make this sausage and this spice blend that goes in it, and it's incredible. They put them, you can buy it here in Louisville at Paul's and stuff for like 10 times the price that you would pay for there, but it's incredible in any dish. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but my first job when I turned 16 was a butcher. And I was a butcher's assistant at a butcher shop called The Meat House in Springfield. My boss uh, ran numbers. And the legend that I've been told and I, I believe is that Jake's 150 recipe was lost in a card game oh. between my boss and Dink. I've heard that story. I- <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's how the recipe got over there. So when I was 16, I was making not Jake's 150. I was making the Meat House version okay. of that sausage. And that's why I still don't have any hair on my arms. <laughs> it, was, it was thousands of pounds a week, every every week, and it was my favorite. So Jake's the reason I still because we got him in Food and Wine magazine. Mm-hmm. There's a little they got a little two page write up or something, and it was because sausage ball recipe we put in there. But there's just something about that sausage and it being iconic. I mean, biscuits and gravy was one of the things that we did for an iconic dish because it happens in a lot of places. But there's not a sausage culture around breakfast sausage in a lot of places like Kentucky. Right. Tennessee could have done it. A couple other southern states could have tried, but Kentucky really. Yeah, it's kind of it like the Ben's history. bacon, you know, or something, you know, of the sausages. Yeah, but. yeah, it really is. It's great. I mean, they still make it in the gas station. I always <laughs> joke it's the best gas station sausage oh, yeah. I've ever had. You know, <laughs> it'll change your life. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that you did with that too, you know, to kind of like bring in some of the northern Kentucky folks. You know, you I, did you use something with Geta as well in the show too? You know what? One of the other episodes definitely got to Geta. Um, I think I put it up, and but some of the things that I put up. They said they already had other episodes for. Gotcha. So that's why there's no fried chicken necessarily in my episode. Or uh, in my case, I try to get them to do fried quail. Um, the hot brown. You know, I worked at the Brown Hotel. It was my first job out of culinary school. But there's no hot brown on our episode because I think that come came on down the line a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it, it was hard coming up with the list. And then as soon as it's done, you think of... 10 more iconic things that, <laughs> yeah. you know, Damn it, mean I something. Think of that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, chow chow or like all these little things. And I'm only from one of the regions. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the other thing. I don't think I gave Western Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky 100% of what they could have had because I'm from Central Kentucky. Sure. And it's a different cuisine, you know? Um, so, how cool was it that I guess the challenge, if you haven't seen the episode, the challenge was to 
create the chefs were to create their own version of what you made for them. How cool was that? And like, and I want to, well, let's talk about that first and I'll ask a follow up question. Uh, honestly, it's kind of surreal. Um, just, just the fact that the way they framed it was that I was the expert on Kentucky cuisine. And I mean, I'm born and raised. I've, I've eaten it since I was born. I've, I do cook professionally and, but for them to sort of believe it and eat it. And you could tell that they believed it because, you know, when they're eating, they could, they could feel how excited we were to share those dishes with them. Um, I think everybody did a great job. I think it's, it's one of the hardest things you can ever do is cook another chef's food mm-hmm. um, when you take it seriously because, you know, it, it's, it's just you can't cook somebody else's food. Um, and so that's why it was so interesting whenever we judged them to sort of go through it and see their influence and, you know, how much did they take away or did they really just cook their meal right. uh, in a way that, yeah, yeah, didn't. And I'm glad few, you said judge a few different, few different spices here and yeah. there. The, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, how hard is it to judge fellow chefs knowing what they've gone through and like, are they like, look, you really need to critique or like. You know what's how do they approach it when you're a judge on the show, or, they, did, or did the producer say like you got to be honest, or you got to you got to no, don't hold back, like yeah, no, how'd that conversation was go? No leading at all. Uh, it was it was, it, and it wasn't that hard. I mean, you know, you take it into account obviously because you, you live the life and you you know you saw how hard it was for them to do the. It looked hot, but it's always hot. <laughs> yeah. Like you know, like that that part was hilarious because it's dramatic for TV. But we used to wear thermometers in our chef coat. And, I mean, it'd be 130 degrees on your station. You know, if you ran a grill station, you literally were cooking. You know, your skin was tight at the end of the <laughs> night. So, you know, 98 degrees with humidity is just what it is. You yes, know, I part mean, of it. There could be a tobacco farmer episode, and it's much hotter, you know. And so, anyway, it was easy from the judging standpoint just because all I do is eat and taste things. <laughs> you know, I mean... You just taste, 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 taste. And you do it so that instantly when you taste something, you know it's right or it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then why is it? It's like picking a bourbon when you go to barrel pick or something. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You're being analytical. I mean, it's not, you know, you don't want to sit in front of Master Distiller and say, uh, this is terrible. (laughs) This one is flat. This one needs more time. You forgot about this one. The tannins are outrageous. Right? But... That's what you have to do when you're spending the money on it. And so that's the same <laughs> yep. same idea, you know. We were the customer. Um, you know, I, I, nobody did a bad job, and that made it a lot easier. Yeah. You know, if somebody had really bombed, none of us wanted to sit there and, you know, rail on them. But I guess we could have. <laughs> you know? It's nice it it funny, Fred yeah. on there, I think he got, like, one line in, and he was like, I was like, that's typical Fred, like critical, like, you know, it's like, get, get my piece in. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you had a lot of FaceTime in it and it was, it was really cool to see a lot of the ways that you were directing people and talking to people about this. But I kind of want to shift a little bit and talk about your, your relationship to Rob Samuels with this as well. But, you know, was there a, was there a pep talk beforehand? Cause I know there was probably like a lot of the line for Maker's <laughs> Mark here to get this right. And he was like, don't screw it up. I trust you, but <laughs> I trust you, but be on your A game today. You know what, Rob, um, I got to give it to Rob. He's pretty hands-off manager when it's big picture. I think, you know, like any good person, when it comes to the details, you got to be involved. But, you know, he he really honestly trusted that we were going to do our absolute best. I think that we've we've done, you know, that the only thing I can promise is that I'll be on time and I'll try my <laughs> best. And, like, there those are go. two things that I I always, you know, sort of do, and Rob knows that. And, you know, I don't – he didn't say anything. It was wonderful. He just he said, "This is Let your you day." Thing. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it was like this. This is your day, and uh, that's about as inspirational of a thing as somebody can tell you. I think uh, they really believe in you whenever they say something like that. So, yeah, Rob was Rob was fantastic about it. The team, you know, the brand. I think the brand might have been more nervous than Rob was. <laughs> right? There's a brand involved. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. and that would have been the guys at Dale Anderson are like yeah, <laughs> freaking out. <laughs> there's agencies and there's budgets and all these things. And I don't blame him. I'd be I'd be worried too if I just sent a chef out to go and represent. But um, I think everybody ended up happy with it. I think that the you know it, the show itself showed off the campus. Unbelievably, mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing I could have done about that. That is no relation to me or my food yeah. or anything. 
but it's a beautiful place to be able mm -hmm. to serve food. And I mean, that's really why we're together is they want hospitality and they want the highest level uh, that, that makes sense as we grow uh, of service and of food. And that's been a sandwich shop and we reopen in you know, a little while. It'll be a different level of that and we'll just keep on sort of evolving. They trust us to do it. And we're really just trying to match up against, you know, dude, growing up in Washington County, there were two types of weddings. Either a beer truck would show up with taps on the side with Bud Light or when you a beer truck and <laughs> bourbon and Coke. And it was always Makers and Coke in a red cup. And like that was, it's iconic. I mean, everybody in my, you know, the guys whose dads worked in distilleries worked at Makers Mark. I could drive there in seven minutes from my parents' <laughs> house and we used to go swimming in the lake. I mean, and so this is before they had 24 hour security. I promise <laughs> you don't want to try to go swimming anymore. Not yeah. anymore. Uh, no, no, don't do that. But, you know, just, just being around that makes us want to raise our game and, you know, yeah, make them proud. So, so after it was over, were you like, sigh of relief, it's done? Or were you like, shit, let's do it again tomorrow? Like, what, were, what was your... No, it was a deep breath. Yeah. It was a solid deep breath. I mean, we, uh, we had lost a couple key staff members right beforehand, um, which is a, always a bummer. But, you know, people got to grow and do their thing. And so it was... It was a little bit trying, you know, but I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Um, I think, you know, 10 minutes later, I was probably ready again. But right away, it was definitely a deep breath. And it was kind of surreal, like I said. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a lot going on in the middle of Loretta, Kentucky. Um, and it's all about food, you know? I mean, I just... Couldn't get any better, yeah. 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 So we're at the pinnacle of the... <laughs> you know, of your trajectory. So let's get back to the beginning. So how does a kid from Springfield, Kentucky get on Top Chef? Talk about how you got into food. Why did you choose food? And why did you think, uh, you know, S Central Kentucky is where you wanted to call home and start your own restaurant? Okay. I'm not loaded in, yeah. not loaded in that question, but yeah. no, just sit back great. and listen. That's, I think you can handle it. <laughs> when I was seven, I wrote a, a letter to culinary school. Um, my mom's a school teacher, and she laminated it. And copied it and kept a copy forever. And I don't know what I was thinking. I have, I have nobody in my family that cooked particularly well. My dad was the big cook. And, I mean, he's a very good cook. But there wasn't a culinary sort of influence on either side. Um, by the time I was 12, I was cooking, like, little three-course meals. And I don't think I'd ever eaten a three-course meal. I don't know where I even knew that you were supposed to have three courses. You didn't see it on TV or I don't know. magazines or anything? We didn't have cable, so <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, it's, it's really weird. And then I, I started culinary school 12 days after I graduated high school. So I was 17. Um, I finished, you know, 18 months later. I went to Sullivan in Louisville. Um, but you were doing it the you were at the butcher shop at 16. Is that what you 16, said? 16, yeah, the day, the day I turned 16, I was at the butcher shop. I stayed at the butcher shop for the first three months of culinary school and then had to move to Louisville because I, I was falling asleep on the drive to, on the drive <laughs> yeah, to school every morning. <laughs> to be honest, it was, yeah, it was a little rough. So uh, I moved to Louisville and uh, had a couple of really terrible, they weren't terrible jobs, it was just jobs in terrible places. And um, it's still some of my biggest learning experiences, just... Things I would never do again, but it was really good to sort of do during culinary school. And then I worked for Joe Castro uh, at the Brown whenever I got out. Chef Joe was still there. Uh, he's the master. It was wonderful working for him. Um, so you right, make a mean hot brown, right? I, we make a very good, we do it Lexington style. So we do the exact hot brown of the Brown Hotel plus country ham. Oh, nice. And I was born in Lexington. So from one to five lived there. And uh, yeah, so I've got a little soft spot. And if you can add country ham, yeah, well, why not? it wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's who doesn't it, love salty ham? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so worked at the Brown Hotel. Um, got a chance to go up to Cummins Diesel Engine. After that, I lived in Columbus, uh, Indiana. So I was the private chef for the owner of the company. And then my boss, he cooked twelve Michelin stars. He was he was just a badass. Uh, Gethin Thomas, and I was his uh, junior and senior sous chef there in Indiana for a couple of years, uh, moved to Scotland, and uh, did a short little stint in Scotland. It wasn't exactly what I 
what I thought I signed up for, but I had a good time. Too much rain. Uh, you know what? The weather, I loved it. I, I only need the sun to make vegetables grow. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a weirdo in that respect. You yeah. know, I really, I dug that. I love the people. Um, if you spend enough summers here, you're like, I'll take uh, cloudy and, yeah. and uh, cool. Yeah, exactly. But uh, Scotland was great, but I had broken up with my girlfriend to move to Scotland. And uh, her name is Rachel, who's now my wife. And oh. so I realized I'd probably just made a couple of mistakes. And I, <laughs> and I moved from Scotland to Chicago. Um, Chicago, I worked at North Pond Restaurant. So it's a Michelin one-star restaurant when I first moved there. And then I got into research and development. I was a corporate chef uh, for companies. Um, I did that for the next six, seven years. We did eight. We always say eight winners. We did eight winners in Chicago. And that was it. Eight winners. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's brutal. It's brutal. Oh, it, it was unbelievable. I mean, my first one or two, I still didn't have proper clothes. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you think you're wearing your Kentucky winter clothes and it doesn't that really do you much. And you're like, slices Ugh. right through you. Ugh. Well, that's what last time I was there, you can't find anybody without those Canadian goose down uh, oh, jackets yeah. nowadays. And those things are expensive, but yeah. there's a reason why they oh, have yeah. them. Yeah. Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, well, it's like, it's like reason- trekking on Everest when you're there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That. And then between jackets and strollers, you spend all your money, you know, cause you can't have, you can't afford two cars. So you get a nice stroller for the second Push, one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we did Chicago. Uh, I, you know, really, really enjoyed the product development side and the research and development. But, uh, long story short, I broke my, Broke my foot and my ankle pretty bad. And I was out of work for six weeks. And I had the sort of job that I could be out of work. And somehow it it worked. And um, my wife just knew I wasn't particularly happy with, you know, the sort of business that I was getting into at the very end. And uh, she said we should open a restaurant in Kentucky. And it wasn't the first time we had ever talked about it. We had obviously... Batting back and forth, what really started happening was barrel picks became mm-hmm. big. So if you think 2011, 12, 13, when the barrel picks, I think that's it's you know 07, 08 is the old old school, but I think of how lots of distilleries started opening up barrel picks, right? Mm-hmm. And our friends all ran bar programs in Chicago. Since I wasn't in a kitchen all the time, now I became really close to bar, you know, bartenders. So Blackbird, the Violet Hour, the Scofflaw Group, like they were our best friends. And they were all coming down to Kentucky and doing barrel picks, going to Louisville, having a blast at Knock Bar and, Mm -hmm. you know, a garage bar, a couple of, you know, places that were around then. Um, Air Devils in. ADI. (laughs) And and then, but then they were coming back and they were bummed out about the food, Yeah, you know, and they were bummed out a little bit about the cocktails, right? There wasn't, you know, in in those years, there weren't cocktail bars. Pearl wasn't around, you know, Mm -hmm. the Silver Dollar wasn't. I was actually getting drinks from uh, the the beverage director for Silver Dollar. Larry. Are you talking about Larry? Uh, No, Susie. Susie Hoyt. So his his partner, Susie, was the bartender at Big Star, which was my local watering hole in Chicago. That makes sense because when I went to Big Star, I was like, this is like an exact replica of Silver Dollar. I was like, which one came first? Uh, Well, the chicken was first. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it was in this case. But I mean, you know, we just saw saw an opening. It kind of, it made me a little bit, uh, not upset. I mean, I wasn't mad at Kentucky or something like that, right? I mean, I chose not to live here for a long time. Um, but I just knew that there are really people doing this now. And it's on the industry level right now. But it's going to get down to a normal person level. And what's going to be there, you know? Um, and we started investigating. I grew up in a an old house built in the 1800s. To get a liquor license in Kentucky is weird. There's still a lot of esoteric kind of blue laws and you know my county is moist uh you know you can have a liquor license in the city but not in the county and then we found out a restaurant was for selling bargetown in a historic old home we could live upstairs was that called circa or circa, circa yeah, yeah yeah that was the name of it was yeah. circa uh because it was built circa 1780 okay um so it's the oldest stone home in nelson county uh and we live on the top two floors and then opened a restaurant on the bottom and that was it. I mean, that was five years ago this year. And um, 
And that was uh, the birth of Harrison Smith House. That was then. the birth of Harrison Smith House, yeah. And then about two years into Harrison Smith House, we started making barbecue sandwiches in the toll house at, at uh, Makers that had 12 seats. And that was the start of Star Hill Provisions. So were, did you approach them about doing that, or did they kind of ask you, like, hey, we need somebody. We got a lot of visitors coming here that are making a destination, but they need something to eat. Hey, it's Kenny here, and I want to tell you about an event that's happening on Saturday, August 24th, because I want to see you in historic downtown Frankfort, Kentucky at Bourbon on the Banks. It's the Commonwealth's premier bourbon tasting and awards festival. There's live music and over 100 vendors of food, beer, wine, and of course, bourbon. But guess what? Even we'll be there in the Bourbon Pursuit booth. You can check out all the events, including tastings with the master distillers that you've heard on the show before, and the People's Choice Award for the best bourbon out there. You can get your all-inclusive ticket for $65, plus you can join on the free Friday night event. Go and check it out, bourbononthebanks.org. Ryan here. Have you ever been traveling or on a date night or just wanted to pack your favorite booze or wine or cocktail and it just turns out to be a big mess? Well, we have a perfect solution for you. The Age of Noir Travel Decanter is made of 500 milliliter hand-blown glass encased in two double-wall stainless steel tumblers, so you got glasses already there with you. We're running a special promotion for Burn Pursuit where you can get yours at PursuitTravelDecanter.com. Go get yours today. There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever before. So how do you find out the best stories and the best flavors? Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Along with two bottles of hard-to-find whiskey, Rackhouse's boxes are full of cool merchandise that they ship out every two months to members in 40 states. In Rackhouse's June box, they're featuring a distillery that claims to be the first distillery to stout a whiskey. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two bottles from there, including its Beer Barrel Bourbon and Beer Barrel Rye, both of which were finished in barrels that were once used to mature America's number one selling bourbon barrel aged stout. And if you're a beer guy like me, you would know that's New Holland's Dragon Milk. Go to RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com to check it out and try a bottle of Beer Barrel Bourbon and Beer Barrel Rye. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. Did you approach them about doing that, or did they kind of ask you, like, hey, we need somebody. We got a lot of visitors coming here that are making a destination, but they need something to eat. You know what? I think that I asked if I could sell barbecue sandwiches Okay. at the Toll House. I think that literally that was about <clears throat> as basic as it, as it started. Um, I, I think before that... There wasn't, I mean, we still opened as the first, I think the first restaurant in a distillery. I think we we got that one or something like yeah. that. And I mean, even then, before that, it was all employees. Mm-hmm. That was that was sort of the focus was how do you be a dining room and then also sort of serve guests. And we just sort of turned that a little bit. And we, we still love, love, love to get the employees in and, and to feed people that work there. But primarily now, yeah, we're guest focused. I mean, that's who's coming in on a... Saturday in October, we're going to see 550 plus guests from 11:30 to 4:30 on a day. Um, so when you, which is pretty good for even an average <laughs> yeah. restaurant, you know? it's it's Insane. unbelievable. Yeah. It's it's a crush, man. It's an absolute crush. And then on Saturdays between May to the end of October, every Saturday night we do ticketed dinners. So you buy your ticket ahead of time. You come in. It's a set three course meal, three cocktails. We write the menu that morning. So we swap from being a fast casual lunch place to as comfortable of a fine dining experience. Because, I mean, mm. we really don't try to add a lot of the stodgy parts. But, you know, it's it's proper food. It's cold smoked fried quail, you know, on a Leonese salad. And, yeah, just, you know, country cooking. But... Tuned up a little bit. Quick, yeah. hop in the makers, man. We gotta go to Whole Foods. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, you know how many times I wish there was a Whole Foods. I'm down there, and you just change. You just have to change what you're doing. So, yeah. like, some of the main food distributors will they come all the way down there, like, uh, like a uh, Creation Gardens or you know what Cisco? Creation? I actually have to get. They deliver to my house in Bargetown. Okay. Since I have the walk-in coolers there. And then I have to take it from my walk-in coolers in Barstown down. They're working on it. 
and hopefully they'll hear this and work on it even faster. <laughs> Very excited to to get deliveries in Loretta. Um, I know some people there. I'll put in. I'll, <laughs> actually, I'll start the pot for you. Hey, well, we we like to use them. Uh, so yeah, but it's 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 a challenge. I mean, I think staff is probably the the biggest challenge. Um, we have great staff. Uh, you know, I think everybody who we employ, we're really lucky to have. But it's finding people with yeah. some passion and talent, and you know, if you're not from there. It can be intimidating, you know. Living in the country is just like living in the city. I mean, they're both intimidating if you aren't from one or the other. Mm-hmm. But it's such a good place, you know. the The pace is right. We can really focus on what it is. If you're into food or drink or beverage, you focus on what matters, and you don't have to spend a lot of time, yeah, with the the extras, the permitting, the you know, sort of the crush that comes around. And so, yeah, staffing's the the so difficult. I got a question just being from the region. So like obviously tourists coming in will embrace and kind of take on, you know, your the quality of food and don't mind paying higher. How hard was it to like convince the locals? Cuz like I know you, you know it's central Kentucky, it's not a wealthy, it's not poor but it's not wealthy, so people are kind of like kind of put off by like high end food sure. because it's so expensive. How hard is it was it to convince people that like come try us? I promise, you know, it's good. I, I got to be honest. People did great. Um, there's always going to be naysayers, right? There's always going to be. But when people see you working your hardest and doing everything you can, and they see the product that you're buying, and they start to get interested in, you know, the rabbits you get and where you get them, and why does this chicken taste different? than chicken that I used to have. Like that was the conversation that really got us through it was yeah. we, we charged what we charged, but it was based in math, right? It, <laughs> I mean, it, it would be terrible if it wasn't, or we wouldn't have been able to right. exist. You know, we buy better products. They cost more money. If we do our job right, they taste that much better. And that's really was the difference maker. You know, there was only two of us that did every bite of food, and every drink basically that ever got served at Harrison Smith House. In the last part, we were lucky to have a couple of friends come and help us on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, Paul Scullis, who has Kuvion Restaurant here in town. Yes, very He came good. and worked with us for a number of months. Uh, we had a, a guy named Anthony who came in and worked with us. He was fantastic. But two of us did 100%. Every bite of pastry, every roll, every deboned chicken thigh every cocktail and um you know i think people yeah yeah, but people got it you know they could that was what helped us get through it you know there were always some pushback there's always a little naysaying i mean you know it's not always getting easy getting my parents to come in because they didn't want me to (laughs) comp them every time and we didn't eat at restaurants like that whenever i was growing up but you know what made it easier was knowing that we did it in rea- based in reality, not trying to get rich or yeah, hell. If we if I learned how to start cooking to get rich, that would have been the wrong place. Step to Step one is you're, you're out of reality now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I I think it's a challenge anywhere. I think that chicken is chicken. I think that when you put eggs with something, everybody thinks it's worth less. Like mm-hmm. these are just common trends that unfortunately follow restaurants around everywhere. And that being said, the tourism business is big enough that we didn't have to cater to anybody in particular. We were really lucky. We got to make our food and sell it. And when we needed to, we added the three-course fried chicken dinner on Wednesday night, you know? And it was still $25 hey, more those. expensive. They yeah. were awesome. <laughs> well, thank I miss you. those. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, for a fried chicken meal, fast food's 5 bucks, and ours is right. 30 so we were still, you know, five times more than people thought. But the number of teachers and like just like you said, real people that came to eat with us, it, it was nothing short of flattering. And, you know, um, so a lot of our best customers weren't. I, I don't want to pretend like I know what their book yeah. was like, but, you know, these super affluent, they, they weren't the who's who of Barstown. <laughs> sure. You know, mm-hmm. now the who's who's did eat there as well. Don't <laughs> right. get me wrong. Sure. You know, yeah. For sure. I want to kind of talk about, so you've been embraced kind of by the bourbon community, like who's involved. And I think a lot of that has probably to do with Drew Colesveen. I know you guys are pretty close. Talked about how you're 
you all got hooked up, I guess, and then kind of how you got thrown into the bourbon community. Yeah. Um, you know, when we moved to Bargetown, I knew who Drew was. Uh, Will, it was really starting to, in a national sense, get more notoriety as to, you know, what KBF uh, is and or I'm sorry, K, K Kentucky Kentucky Bourbon Festival or Kentucky no, Distillers no, Association. Just, neither no, the, the name all of, of them. Good the, Kentucky. No, the yeah Kentucky Bourbon Distillers or yeah that, KBD. Yeah, okay. there we go. Drew, all right, good. Their parent company. There we go. Yeah, there okay. we go. <laughs> and people were starting to yeah, as we can tell, they were starting to figure that out. And so I saw Drew and I, you know, sort of in the media, and I was like, man, I I hope that I can get to know this guy. Um, I hope that this is who our peer set sort of becomes and ended up meeting when we're talking about best customers. I mean, nobody, oh, he's there like every day. Nobody ate. At I the remember restaurant. when you first came out, he was like, thank God this place moved in. <laughs> like finally get a decent meal. <laughs> no, Drew, <laughs> Drew without a doubt. It was the, and, and still is really one of the biggest supporters we've had for the restaurant. He, um, he really lo- he loves cuisine. I mean, he, he embraces it. Uh, high and low. It doesn't have to be fancy. If it is, he still likes that an awful lot. Um, <laughs> but no, he was just, you know, and then we got to know each other. I, I remember he gave us a gift when we opened and we barely knew each other. We'd met a couple of times and he brought me a Newsome ham uh, foot on, like one of these, you've got to be in line for three years. Like hands. the ones he ages in the basement? <laughs> yes. Well, then we got him on that for a little while, but uh, this ham was... I mean, it was one of the most special things we'd ever gotten. He just brought it in, gave it to us. Here you go, guys. Thanks for being in town. And uh, sort of went from there. We'd hang out, you know, obviously with such a cult bourbon, uh, you know. It was really interesting to go over to his place. And once you see his uh, his bourbon collection, it makes you want to stop collecting bourbon a little yeah, bit. Yeah, just go <laughs> you to know? his house. And- well, you just – it's it's just a realization sort of moment, you know. You go, well – I guess I could have a lot of Willet or a lot of anything, right? Yeah. But I'm never going to have it all. It's like Maker's Bottles, right? We, we started collecting those at the restaurant for a little while. But these Maker's fans, they have a million times more than we'll ever have. <laughs> yeah. So now we open the collectible ones, and like we do them all as a charity bottle. So people just freak out because they see their collectible bottles open, but we put the whole price of the shot towards charity. And then we get to see what whiskey made at that time tasted like mm-hmm. i'll tell you what the 96 championship bottle fantastic it's got some denim in it it's fantastic <laughs> it's got notes of denim yeah exactly <laughs> exactly but you know so anyway back to drew we uh yeah we just hit it off man um yeah. and then he got me into cigars you know oh, like we yeah. just he, if you if you think he has a lot of will it's wait till you <laughs> see his cigar collection it's mm-hmm. yeah he's got a he's got a pretty pretty righteous selection and you know, we just always had something to talk about. I'm interested in the whiskey. He's interested in food. We both sort of have mutual respect, I think, for for what the other one's doing. And and he was just a massive supporter. I mean, there's nothing like putting your money where your mouth is. And, you know, if you want to have nice things, you have to work at it. And he was always down to do his part to make sure that, you know, we were doing well. I mean, in our first year when things were really hard, you know, he, that's when Whiskey Pig started. Or, mm-hmm. <laughs> Now known as Bourbon yeah, Bonanza. Yeah, known as... But maybe pig, now yeah, we can call it Whiskey Pig again. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, I don't know, but it... Uh, I like Whiskey Pig better. But, you know, <laughs> him starting that was was a big move. Between that and there's a guy named Greg Jensen. Do you guys know Greg? I know the name, yes. I know okay, out of, out of California. My wife and I were walking. We were pushing a stroller. Uh, maybe we'd been open for two or three weeks, and it was our first... Like, I think I had four hours off and we were taking a walk and we met this gentleman and he seemed lost and we gave him directions. And then he asked if we knew about the restaurant on the corner and we're like, yeah, it's ours. Long story short, he comes in the next night with his uh, wife and his mother-in-law and it's the first time anybody's ever asked for a tasting menu. He says, can you do it? Mm -hmm. And Josh and I are in the back and we're sweating and we're like nervous and like goosebumps, and we're like, yeah, we can do that. That's that's what we've trained to do, but we thought we were coming to make fried chicken, you know? <laughs> and I swear, I think we cooked everything we could. He drank wine. He drank bourbon. They had a blast, and the ticket might have been 300. Mm-hmm. 300. Like, we just, 
we threw the wall at him, and yeah, it he still had one of the wasn't best experience. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. It wasn't bad because we just weren't set for that yet, you know. Um, but he was deeper in the bourbon world than we would have known, and he started telling people. And then we started doing these dinners for barrel picks because I think your second part of the question was, how do we get involved in the the community? And that was it. That I mean, between Drew and the whiskey pig, and then sort of guys starting to do their their picks, you know, and then have a dinner for 20 afterwards. That did it. And, uh, you know, it just built and built and built. And we still do those dinners all the time at Harrison Smith House. I mean, we... We've been at one. We yeah. Have, we have. Yeah. You know, I kind of want to talk a lot about, you know, where did your passion for bourbon come from as well? You know, we really haven't really talked about because you do. You you drink bourbon. Like, you have, you, have, you have a knack for it. You love it. You know, where where did that passion really come from as well? Um, swimming in Maker's Lake. Yeah. <laughs> swimming in the lake helped. Uh, I mean, just being very honest, the earliest moonshine that we used to be able to get was always in empty Maker's bottles, which is odd, but mm-hmm. it was one of those little connection things. And, uh, you know, for me, I, it, it was just a national, you know, it's a pride thing. I, yeah, I like gin. I love drinking a gin and tonic. Don't get me wrong. But... Knowing where it's from, what it is, what it's made out of, the people who grew the corn, the people who make it. Like, at this point, there's no turning back from it, right? It's like, I love scotch. I love all these things. There's, you know, I'm I'm pretty equal opportunity. But bourbon is the sort of, you know, the sun. And other (laughs) things evolve around Mm -hmm. it in terms of our beverage selection choice. Um, It makes sense because of where we are, obviously. But even if it wasn't, so many of the classic cocktails I love, even at Barstown Bourbon right now, they do the tiki drinks with bourbon Mm -hmm. uh, involved. I love that. I mean, it's just versatile. Um, I don't know. My grandma drank bourbon. My great aunt, who our house cocktail is... You know, we have a house cocktail. We've had it since the day we opened Harrison Smith, and it's still at Makers. And it's what she would make for herself every day at 11 a.m. when the Price is Right was on. And she would make one highball and watch Bob Barker, and then I guess and you got the yodeler going on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the mountain, <laughs> yeah. plinko and and highball, plinko, yeah. <laughs> and that's what she would do. And I can remember as a little kid helping her get the ice bucket. And watching this sort of go down. And, uh, you know, my grandma would drink uh, Heaven Hill Green Label and Coke. And at Christmas time, my dad would buy her a bottle of Makers. And she would always, it was just like, you, it was a script. She'd say, Pat Newman, I can't, I can't put Coke with that. You know I can't <laughs> have that. And, you know, it was just one of these little cultural things that, like, I didn't grow up thinking about a prohibitionist sort of stance on Mm-hmm. A lot of things and alcohol. I mean, it just, yeah. So the family was going to drink a little bit of bourbon and that, yeah, that was it. So I got another kind of question for you because, you know, you, you've talked about makers a lot, but you know, we knew, you know, when we talk about chefs and bourbon. There's a, there's a few that stand out that had these kind of like magical pairings, right? So, you know, the late Anthony Bourdain, he had a very tight connection to loving Pappy Van Winkle. Uh, Chef Sean Brock, very into like the very, very old Fitzgeralds. Well, not anymore. Well, not anymore. <laughs> right, but right. do you have something that you have in a collection that you adorn that you go back and, and like that's your that's your kind of like staple thing that you love? I'll be honest. If we're going to talk vintage at all. Um, it could be anything. I like yeah. I like two. I like two things together. I like almost I like the weirdest of the weird so this could mean i mean you get to hang out around distillers so you know there's things that never get a label put on them absolutely Mm -hmm. um i want that i want that sea creature that iodine that weird maybe it's off way off some people like i want way off profile and i want aged chartreuse Mm -hmm. those are my two (laughs) things i want a little sip of both of those i mean but you know, I mean, because genuinely, the best things I've ever had didn't have a label, and yeah. they wouldn't have passed any QC test. They um, and, and there's a couple of distilleries, to be perfectly honest. I mean, you know that I've that I've had that from. Um, Go ahead, we're it, listening. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me check the uh, the label reports, and I'll get right. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. I mean, I'm not trying to, to trying to dodge it, but. I'm not really a brand guy. I don't. I don't have one thing that I've always gravitated towards more than the other. It's 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 constant 
just trying taking a few few shots of Heaven Hill White Label and Old Bardstown with you in the back, and you know with you you and Drew. Without a doubt, I mean the highest of the high and the lowest of the low is really where I want to sit. I mean that that's you know the most time where where I find the most pleasure is those two sort of spectrums of things. I think the middle is where things get cloudy a little bit. Um, you know that fifty dollar price range nowadays. That's mm-hmm. sixty seventy five is just a a different sort of piece than it used to be and and give me below or above that and uh i'm usually generally pretty happy (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah so there's another thing i kind of want to talk about and this kind of goes back to uh because i I think we would do ourselves a disservice if we didn't grab this little nugget of information because we were upstairs and you were talking about your time in uh the corporate world that you had a hand in uh one of the most uh i'm glad you brought the the biggest (laughs) breakfast sandwiches that are out there today so kind of talk about that my my hangover cure of choice yeah (laughs) so one of my very first projects that i was involved in so i i'm 22 years old or 20 maybe 23 i don't know and lived in chicago and i get a job uh, at this product development firm and they work with all kinds of different um food service companies coming up with new products and McDonald's wants to come up with something new, something innovative. And uh, they decide to do a pancake sandwich, right? What do they call that? The McGriddle? <laughs> yep. The, the oh, yeah. old McGriddle. Um, and so our part in it is how do you deliver syrup without getting it on somebody's hands? Mm-hmm. And that was our piece of the project. And we worked and worked and worked and ended up with these little encapsulated, you know, uh, like Halloween when you go out trick or treating, they'd have those bats and you bite them and there's like juice inside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, that food grade wax is what we ended up using. And each one of those McGriddles has tiny little pocket of syrup wrapped oh, in I food grade it was just wax. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> it is magic. <laughs> it, it truly is. Because the thing is, if I was to give you a handful of them to eat, they would never melt in your mouth. It takes a certain like cooking temperature before they'll fully melt and yeah it's encapsulation and uh so yeah yeah that was a fun project but you know the one around here gets everybody is campfire chicken for uh cracker barrel the oh, one really? they do all the yeah. billboards of yeah that photo got taken in a basement in chicago seven <laughs> years ago like how wild is that you know this sort of country looking dish mm-hmm. of a half a chicken roasted with carrots and stuff was a Kentucky boy in Chicago selling to a Tennessee company to put on billboards all over Louisville. <laughs> it's a weird little like, combo. A circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> and so like kind of one of the last questions that I have is is kind of, you know, we've talked about bourbon, we've talked about food, but where do the two kind of really intersect for you? Um, do you look at it as a way of, of cooking, does more pairing? Like what, what what's your real take on it? You know, people ask a lot about what I think pairs best, and I know that's not the question, but part of it is, you know, and I, I'm just a firm believer that good goes with good, and it's not a scapegoat example to, like, get out of pairing things, because I could give you exacts, but I think that genuinely there's, like, a couple of levels that you can enjoy food and bourbon and everything else on. You know, there's the straight hedonist level, which is great, and it's a little bit too much of, you know, responsibly too much of everything. Uh, but, you know, lots of food. It's like the dinner I cook for Top Chef. It's too much food. Mm-hmm. It's too much, but it's just too much, right? You feel good about it. You're going to eat the leftovers. You're not wasting it. But, you know, there's sort of that level of pairing. And then when you go to the high end, we just got back from, from Spain, uh, my wife and I. And, you know, we were doing these sort of Michelin tasting menus, and it was amazing how much the pairings played into the total meal. And it was a reminder to me because with cocktails, we had to be a little bit more careful. We can't go 10 courses, 10 cocktails. It's never going to work. You know, wine and beer sort of have that play. But I, I came back with just a, a stronger desire to think about what exactly does go together. And instead of always good goes with good, that will work. But like there's some next level pairing things going on. And, you know, that's why you travel and see things. Is you get humbled and inspired, inspired yeah. at both, and realize what you should be doing a little more of. And and I did. And so moving forward, you know, I'm excited to sort of look a little deeper. And like I, we all know, black walnuts and bourbon go together. But why? And what's the best way to eat that black walnut? Right? Is it is it candied so it's shattery? Is it uh, pickled so it's kind of soft and has a different texture? Is it as a garnish for a drink? Is it ground up as the rim for a glass. I mean, there's, I don't know. I could think of more, but uh, 
that's what I'm excited about right now, moving mm-hmm. forward, and, and just you know, that's where I see bourbon and food coming back together. Oh, fantastic! Very cool. So the other thing that we also want to know is that you know people want to be able to go visit Star Hill Provisions. Uh, also, get the, just get the Benedict get, and get bacon. That. That's my favorite thing. It's yes. really good. <laughs> but you know, also let people know that you know this is this is your thing as well, right? This isn't um, you know a, a Beam Centauri owned venture like like Star Hill Provisions is you. It's a team of of you and uh, your 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 chefs and everything. So yeah, it kind of is. talk about that real quick too. Yeah. It, and, and props to makers for letting us, you know, for having a vision and, and letting us sort of be independent. But my wife, my brother, and myself own and operate the restaurant. Um, makers definitely supports us in every way possible. They're, they're there, they're our team. Um, but you know, when it comes time to people getting paid and you know, when you're coming down to support your local business, like it's us, it really <laughs> is, you know, a mom and pop spot uh, with a brother as the general manager. And, um, you know, I don't think that should drive anybody to or for, you know, uh, but, you know, that is the situation down there right now. And I think it's good for them because they're a wonderful manufacturer, right? They make amazing bourbon. They've been doing it a long time and that's what they do perfectly. And I think it's very smart that they decided to sort of farm out what is not your core competency you know Mm -hmm. i'm not going to give them tips on how to make bourbon (laughs) right that's for sure (laughs) you know uh and and so yeah thanks for bringing that up but that is that is how the the business side of things works down there Mm -hmm. and now you get to say hi to denny over there a lot now too oh man we get to say hi to denny all the time i love seeing denny over there he uh yeah i feel like you eat two peas in a pod yeah yeah he does a great job at what he does i mean you know he's been crushing it for a long time and I think he likes getting back to Maker's Mark. Um, you know, his previous time there, he really loved it. And, yeah, I want to race his truck sometime. He drives around a little uh, Ford Raptor. <laughs> oh, he's, he's got yeah. one of those nice, did he's, nice. Did he's moving around. He's moving up in the world. There we nice. go. It's- I want to close, or not close, but maybe wrap up with this question. So you you mentioned Bardstown Bourbon Company. You guys kind of were the for, on the forefront of the hospitality side of <laughs> the bourbon tourism um, I guess Kentucky Owls moving in to mm-hmm. Bardstown. What do you? How do you see the future unfolding for uh, you know the whole hospitality experience and the Bourbon Trail experience in Bardstown? I think in Bardstown Loretta County or whatever. I mean, you know, Central Kentucky. <laughs> well, I'll speak to Bardstown first because I think it is different. I think that Bardstown, if uh, if the local population decides they want to become a tourist mecca, they will be. Mm-hmm. Well, and, for, I forgot, and then Willits is also, they just hired like Sean Brock, chef, and they're going to have. Yeah, you know, John Sleesman. And yep. he's, yeah, a fantastic talent. I mean, I can't wait until uh, he gets a restaurant so I can come and eat at somebody's <laughs> restaurant too. Well, that's what I was telling Drew because we go to bars and where I was like, well, we can finally go to your place instead of coming over here. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, but I think Barstown has endless potential. I, I truly do. But I think it needs buy in from the people that actually live there all the time. Earlier when we were getting our our letters mixed up, bar, the the Bourbon Fest is a good example. You know, what does that want to be? You know, what can it be? Um, you know, those are the sort of things and questions that I think are going to affect Barstown as to whether it's really going to become the hot spot for the entire trail. I think yeah. the opportunity's there. Versus, I think it already... Well, versus Louisville yeah, being versus in the beginning Lexington, or Lexington kind of. being it. Yeah, I think the opportunity is there. And um, I don't know which way it'll go. You know, I mean, we believe in it. We've got a lot of reasons to believe in it. And we're not planning on doing anything different. Um, as far as Loretta goes, Maker's vision for the future is strong. Um, you know, knock on wood, we'll be part of it, uh, you know, as long as we possibly can. But, you know, they they have a really, really strong desire to make, you know, that part of Kentucky – the most culturally relevant part that they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And for me, I can't think of a better goal or mission, right? It's like cook good food and then create some sort of interest and then create a value for all our farmers, right? These people are doing an amazing job and they don't have tobacco anymore. And so they don't have a cash crop to really get them through things. So, you know, could food be it? Could, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, growing up on a tobacco farm, like I would like to see uh, happen. And, you know, and I think, yeah, there's a good lot of opportunities. Opportunity. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we've had Rob and Bill on the show. And, I mean, if one thing stands out about them both, they have great vision and great execution on that vision. So I think the area is in good hands. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And so we'll close it out with that. But, you know, I want to also give people the opportunity if all of a sudden, hey, they know about Harrison Smith House. They want to come in. They're coming in for a barrel pick. They've got 20 people lined up. And they want to They want to have something. How do they get in contact with you? Absolutely. Uh, we do have a website, harrisonsmithhouse.com. Uh, you just send an, in, uh, an email to the info at, and my wife, Rachel, is going to be the one getting back to you. Um, and then same thing, we do the private events at Star Hill Provisions as well. Um, we are underneath the Maker's Mark website. So if you go to makersmark.com and go to the restaurant segment, you'll be able to get a hold of us there. Uh, and it has all of our sort of information and hours. And we do the same sort of dinners there as well. Um, and then if you ever want to see something that I've put out, I'm bourbon and ham. Uh, so all social media accounts, all one word, bourbon and ham. Two of my so favorite things. Yeah. I've liked it long enough to get that handle. So you know <laughs> yeah. it's been gone for a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually, last question, because you said that we had, you had gotten the, the place that was originally called Circa. Why did you rename it to Harrison Smith House? Yeah, and that's what's a good the, question. And what's the, uh, the connotation? So the, the real reason is the house as it originally was built was the Harrison slash Smith House. They named homes after the the builder and owner of the home. Um, the flip side of that is my brother's name is Harrison. And so once they like told me today. that the original <laughs> yeah. name of the house was the Harrison Smith house, it was just a no brainer. It was just an absolute. You have a lot of full circle stories. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's weird, man. It's weird. Yeah. It, well, because you can't say no to things. I'm just going to start walking like around you. To you know, like good things are going to happen to me. <laughs> just going to drop nuggets of information. Oh, yeah, man, the Harrison Smith house. And so that was it. And now my brother has to answer the phone and say, hello, this is Harrison. Thank you for calling the Harrison Smith house. <laughs> and people don't know what to do. And it makes <laughs> like, my day. Uh, yeah. it, it makes my day. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so Newman, thank you again for coming on the show today. We were very happy able to get you on because yeah. uh, apparently a chef's schedule is very hectic. So yeah. I'm glad this was actually <laughs> able to work out. Glad you today. Yeah. Hey, so. y'all, thank y'all so much. I'm really glad we got it done. And yeah, anytime. I'd love to come back sometime. Very cool. Yeah, we're going to make it happen. Absolutely. So if you like what you hear, make sure you support the show on Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. You can also follow us on all those social media handles at Bourbon Pursuit as well. And Ryan, kind of close us out and make sure people leave us reviews too. Yeah, leave us reviews. Tell us, give us some feedback comments show notes or not we do the show notes we always show do suggestions show notes. <laughs> you know because we like hearing back from you we want to hear what or we want to know what you want to hear so we can bring that to you because that's who we're here for is you guys so appreciate you all listening newman that was I, I could sit here and talk to you for hours so it was very cool and i appreciate your time so hey, thank we'll you. see you all next time <laughs>